Okay, today we're going to talk about um, preserving species in a habitat. So first of all, let's look at arguments for why we should preserve species in habitats. Um, and the first reason is just an ethical argument, the idea that every species has a right to live, um, that wildlife has cultural importance, and we don't want to deprive future generations of the species that exist today. Another argument is the aesthetic, the idea that the natural world is beautiful, provides inspiration, and we always want those landscapes to see. Another argument is economic. Uh, we get economic goods like food, fuel, and lumber from species and habitats. We get new commodities um, like medicines. A lot of our medicines come from tropical rainforest. Uh, we can use um, genetics to improve varieties of our crops. And also ecotourism. Ecotourism generates $500 billion worldwide each year. Um, for example, our lion here, um, a living lion in Kenya generates $515,000 in tourist money, but if it's killed for its skin, it only generates $1,000. So we have more money in ecotourism um, if we preserve the species in that habitat than if it was not protected. All right, so how do we preserve these species? Well, we have both governmental and non-governmental organizations, and I mentioned this briefly in your last video, um, but I do wanna talk about what some of the big differences are and what might be the benefits of governmental over non-governmental and vice versa. So governmental organizations are those that represent a single country, like the Environmental Protection Agency or the Fish and Wildlife Service in the United States. Or if we're looking at um, worldwide, uh, might be the United Nations Environmental Program or UNEP. Non-governmental organizations are things like Greenpeace um, and WWF or the World Wildlife Fund, which we'll talk a little bit about as well. All right, so when we compare the two, a governmental organization, again, is part of either a national, uh, state, department, or local government. Um, ultimately, they are responsible to the voter. They do have the authority to prosecute violations of regulations within their jurisdiction. So in the U.S., again, that would be um, like the Fish and Wildlife Service. In other countries, we might have... Um, similar uh, type bodies and other branches. So intergovernmental is um, where you have multinational organizations. So the United Nations is where we see a lot of these organizations. Um, most agreements that are made by these intergovernmental organizations are not legally binding under international law, but each country that signs the agreements um, agrees to regulate those conservation efforts within their own territory. Um, so I mentioned UNEP. Um, we also have CITES, which is a treaty we'll talk about, and the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Right. Um, Non-governmental organizations like Greenpeace, WWF, there's many others, but those are two of the more prominent that you usually see ads and commercials from. But they work independently from governments. Um, they still have the same goal of protecting threatened species protecting areas. And a lot of times they'll form partnerships with governmental organizations um, because each type of organization can be more effective in different ways. So let's look at what some of those are. One is the use of media. Um, governmental organizations usually have a media liaison who prepares and reads written statements. Um, Whereas our non-governmental or non-governmental organizations usually use footage of activities to gain attention. So a lot of times you'll see protests, um, or you see the Greenpeace doing a lot of those. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of video clips for that. Um, in terms of speed of response, our governmental organizations are going to be very slow because oftentimes they have to come to consensus on differing views between different parties. Um, 
whereas the non-governmental organizations can respond very quickly. Um, there are more diplomatic constraints on the governmental organizations. Um, they're often hindered by political disagreement, both within the country and international, whereas our non-governmental organizations are not affected by those political restraints and often even include illegal activity to get their point across. In terms of enforcement, um, we can uh, prosecute the breaking of laws for the international agreements and the national agreements whereas our non-governmental organizations, of course, have no legal power whatsoever. So they depend on um, persuading the public and then the public in turn persuading the governmental organizations. So that's why you'll see um, ads such as these in magazines or on TV or now um, on web pages as well. Um, so what are some of the strategies that these organizations, especially the governmental organizations, take to conserve species and habitats. One approach is the species approach, where you identify which species are at greatest risk of becoming extinct, understanding that species and focusing your efforts just on those. Um, so it's protecting their critical habitats, um, legally protecting the endangered species, propagating the species in captivity, which is um, helping animals to reproduce like in a zoo setting or in a research lab. The ecosystem approach, instead of looking at individual species, focuses on the ecosystem as a whole, making sure that we have a variety of biomes, that we've got enough land and aquatic areas protected so that we can provide the habitat for the majorities of species that we have today, both terrestrial and aquatic. Um, so again, that's looking at different biomes, different aquatic systems, um, and that may be done in several ways. It could be private purchase or government action of protecting land, um, eliminating alien species, which are non-native species. Non-native species tend to take over and um, because they have no natural predators, they take resources that the native species need. Managing protected areas to sustain the native species that are there and restore ecosystems that have been degraded. So that's a more holistic approach, looking at the ecosystem instead of just individual species. Um, one way to protect species, again, we said was protecting land. So we do have wildlife refuges in the U.S. There's 508. Um, there's a few in North Carolina. Most of the wildlife refuges are to protect waterfowl. Um, we've got a lot around our rivers and coast of North Carolina, and you can see here where those are located. All right, um, other solutions to protecting species, um, I mentioned zoos, but egg pooling is collecting wild eggs and then hatching them in a zoo setting so they're not eaten by predators. You can protect them when they're young, um, especially if they are our selected species um, whose parents don't care for them. Uh, captive breeding where, is where instead of pulling the eggs, you catch the individuals, you breed them in captivity, and then you can reintroduce the offspring into the wild. Um, two examples of success with captive breed, breeding have been the peregrine falcon and the black-footed ferret. Here's a few other um, examples as well. Uh, wildlife management is another solution to protecting species, um, and so that's using laws to regulate hunting and fishing, having to have licenses to either hunt or fish. There's harvesting quotas for hunters and fishermen. Planting vegetation that's food for the species that um, live in those habitats and protecting the flyaways from migratory waterfowl. Um, a lot of those are protected by managed, or sorry, managed by international treaties because birds just don't stay within one country. Um, think about the birds that migrate from Canada to Mexico. All right, also, um, when we design protected areas, we have to um, take a few things into account. We'll do an activity in class with this probably tomorrow. Um, but protected areas oftentimes become islands within a country. Um, and we'll talk about something called the principle of island biogeography. 
Um, but within these islands, um, a lot of times, it actually results in a loss of diversity. Um, when we are deciding these protected areas, we have to decide on the size, the shape, um, edge effects. So that's um, outside of the island. Uh, what are the effects that surrounding areas have? Are there roads, shopping malls, train tracks, things like that? Because um, the more edges there are, the more vulnerable those species within that protected area or island are going to be affected. Um, corridors, which allows um, safe passage for um, the animals that live there, to, again, to protect them from those edge effects. Um, so the larger the protected area, the better it's going to be because that's going to support more species uh, resulting in greater diversity. With greater diversity, you'll have less inbreeding um, and also less risk of natural disaster wiping out the species that are present. Um, so edge effects I mentioned, you want um, there to, to minimize, you want the edge effect to be minimized. Um, so you just don't want um, the edge of your protected area to immediately become, um, you know, a human developed area, whether it's a farm, a housing development. So you want some sort of buffer zone uh, between your protected area and human influence. Um, if you have a long, thin reserve as opposed to a larger round one, you're going to have larger edge effect because within your protected area, your distance from an edge at any given time is not very far. Um, another term that you need to know is an ecotone, and that is where two habitats meet and there is a change near the boundary. So again, buffer zones can help with these, but an ecotone can be between two separate biomes. It can be between a terrestrial and aquatic, or it can be, um, again, like an edge between a protected area and a developed area. Um, so I talked about the corridors. So if you look in this image here, you see the corridor that connects these two separate reserves. Um, a lot of times they'll be built under roads or railway lines so that animals completely or can safely cross from one way to another. Um, within the corridors, however, it does allow spread of disease from one reserve to another. They're more exposed to the edges, so you have um, the risk of hunters or poachers. They do allow gene flow, so you have more diversity, and it does allow for seasonal migrations as well. All right, um, and that's it for the slides today. Again, we'll spend a little bit more time in class talking about this theory of island biogeography and what it means for protected areas.